Good morning, good morning. What another great day that the Lord has made. And what are we going to do? We are going to rejoice and be glad in it. This is Pastor Ron Taylor here at Arise Christian Center. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory and honor because you have shown your faithfulness to us once again. You lifted us to see yet another day, and we're thankful for it. And Lord, I pray now that your will be done, that your purpose goes forth, and today is a day of victory in and through Christ Jesus. We thank you for each and every one that is tuned in. And Lord, I ask now that you would bless them, that Lord God, you will strengthen them through your word today. And again, you deserve the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Yes, this is a great day. Hallelujah. I'm glad that you have joined us. This is going to be our first day that we are coming back and having live fellowship here at Arise. Uh, right now, we are working out some media things to where we can do it simultaneously where we're having the live services and uh, online services at the same time. We're still working that out. But in the meantime, I still want to bring you the word, those of you who are online, and then we'll be also bringing this same word to those who are live. And so until we do it simultaneously, we'll, we'll still continue to bring the word of God to you online. Hallelujah. Well, Today is Palm Sunday. Hallelujah. We're going to be talking about that in the message today. And I know that this word is going to be an encouragement to you. Amen. So let's make our faith declaration and then we'll get into the word of the Lord. Are you ready today to receive the word of God, to hear the word of God, to be built up in faith? to carry out what God has called you to do? Well, I want you to stay tuned and have those ears to hear. Amen? Let's make our faith declaration right now. By the word of God, I will think right, I will talk right, I will walk right, I will live right. How are we going to do it? By the word of God, I will think right, I will talk right, I will walk right. I will live right. Spirit of the living God, move and have your way. We thank you now for your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, again, today, uh, being Palm Sunday, I'm going to be sharing a message that can be entitled From Sunday to Sunday from Palm Sunday to Resurrection Sunday. And this week, from Palm Sunday all the way to Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, it is referred to as Holy Week. Or some may call it Passion Week. And so I'm going to be sharing with you in this message here, the events of Jesus during Passion Week leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. And so this message is going to be sharing with you the events of Jesus leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. And I'm also going to be sharing with you how does the events of Jesus impact us as Christians today? What was Jesus teaching his disciples, his followers, and the church? Was, was he teaching them during Passion Week that impacts us today? It's always important to understand that whenever Jesus taught his disciples, that means that it was also for the church today. Amen. And so we'll be looking at this in scripture. And again, 
You can call this from Sunday until Sunday. And so we're going to go now to the Gospel of Mark chapter 11. Each day of Passion Week, from Sunday to Sunday, each day of that week, Jesus was teaching his disciples a lesson. He was giving them knowledge and wisdom about kingdom living and the kingdom of God. Let me say that again because this is what we're going to be focusing on. Each day of that week, that last week before Jesus went to the cross, he was teaching his disciples and his followers. He was giving them knowledge and spiritual understanding about kingdom living and the kingdom of God. I want you to think about it now. If you were in your last week upon the earth, what would you want to share with those who walk with you? You would want to give them wisdom and knowledge and understanding for the purpose of your life or that which you were involved with with them. And this is what Jesus was doing with his disciples. He was teaching them about kingdom living and the kingdom of God. And I, and I want you to know that what he taught them also applies to us. So let's go now to Mark 11, beginning with verse 1. It says, Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a coat and a donkey tied. Here it says coat, but in Matthew, the other gospel, it says donkey. You will find one tied on which no one has set. Loose it, <coughs> excuse me, and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the coat tied to the door outside on the street. And they loosed it. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing? Loosing the coat. And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded. So they let them go, speaking of the donkey and the coat that was tied. Then they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Now I'm going to stop right there because there are some things I want us to get that is embedded in these scriptures. This is what is referred to as the triumphal entry. This is that Sunday, the first day of the week, that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to go to the cross, to go ahead uh, uh, and lay down his life for us. So this is on a Sunday, the first day of the week, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And he sent two of his disciples into a village opposite them to go and bring him a donkey and a coat or his foal. And Jesus said to them, he says, the donkey is going to be tied up. And he says, and if anyone says anything to you, let them know that the Lord has need of it 
and they will release it and send him here to me. Even in these verses of scripture, we find that Jesus was teaching a lesson to his disciples. Oftentimes, the disciples did not get it until later on. And so I want you to understand that Jesus was giving them principles, kingdom principles, about kingdom living and the kingdom of God and how to carry on that which he had already begun, how to build the church and how to establish the church through these teachings that he shared with them. And so the lessons that we find in these first few verses of scripture is this. Know that the Lord is omniscient. Know that the Lord is omniscient. In other words, the Lord knows all things. The Lord knows all things. This was a lesson that he was teaching the disciples. He knew exactly where the donkey was in a village opposite them. He knew that the donkey was tied up. He knew that the donkey had never been set upon, had never been ridden. And he knew that there will be people there that will inquire about them loosing the donkey. He knew all the conditions. He knew all things concerning this donkey. And as the disciples went over to this village, it said that when they came into the village, they saw the donkey tied up. And as they were loosing the donkey, the people asked them and inquired, what are you doing loosing the donkey? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And of course, the donkey was brought to Jesus. There's a word in this for you. There's a lesson that he was teaching the disciples and his followers. And there's also a lesson that he wants us to get today. And that lesson is the Lord is omniscient and the Lord knows all things. I want you to hear this. The Lord knows exactly where you are. I said the Lord knows exactly where you are. The Lord knows what or who may have you tied up. My God. I says the Lord knows who or what that may have you tied up. And the Lord knows, hallelujah, praise God, that he has purpose for your life. He has, he, he, he has a, 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 a reason for your life. He has use of your life, just like for the donkey. He said, let them know that the Lord has need of it. And I want you to understand that just like he sent the two disciples to loose the donkey, I want you to know that God has somebody that is on the way right now that is going to loose you from being tied up. I don't know what it is that has you tied up. I don't know what it is that may have you bound, but I want you to understand that he's coming, praise God, and help us on the way that you may be loose, that you may be untied. Why? Because the Lord has need of you. I said the Lord has need of you. And he's going to untie you from whatever that has you tied up. Jesus understood that he was on his way to the cross. He was coming into Jerusalem as the Lamb of God to be slain that we may be free, that we would no longer be tied up, that we will no longer be in bondage. 
He was coming to loose us. And just like he was sending the disciples to loose this donkey, I want you to know that he's coming and he has come to loose you. Whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. Yes, why is he losing you? Because he has need of you. My God. I said he has need of you. He has purpose for your life. And the purpose that he has your life is going to make a difference in the lives of many others. He knows where you are. He knows your conditions. And he has come that you may be loosed. Just like he had the donkey to be loose, so shall he have you loose. Another thing I want you to get here is that Jesus, he came for that purpose to set captives free. Those who were bound, those who were in chains and in bondage, he came to set you free. And so in this season of resurrection, in this season of what we call Easter, in this week of Passion Week, of Holy Week, I want you to understand that Jesus came with the purpose in mind, and that purpose in mind was to untie you and set you free. Somebody ought to give God some praise right now because you know how you were tied up. You know the conditions that you face. But yet and still, Jesus came. My God, I said he came and he came and he set you free. No longer are you in bondage to sin. He came and he untied you. Why? He has need of you. God desires to use you. Yes, that's right. You are valuable to God. God has purpose and he has a need for your life, for your gifts, for your talent, for your ability. I want you to notice something. And I want you to get something here about this lesson in, in Mark 11. The donkey did not get untied until Jesus commanded it. Oh, let me say that again. The donkey did not get untied until Jesus commanded it. And we need to know that Jesus has placed a demand on our liberty. And he has went beyond just placing a demand on our liberty. He has laid down his life that we may be free, yeah. that we may be loosed, that we may be untied. Can you give God some praise right there? Can you magnify and lift up his name? He untied you. You were tied up until he commanded you to be loosed. And if he had not sent help, if he had not showed up, if he had not come and gone to the cross, you'll still be tied up. But we give praise to him. We give glory unto him. Because through Christ Jesus, I've been set free. I've been untied. Jesus was teaching, even going to the cross. We come down a little further in Mark 11, and we see in verse 7, then they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their clothes on the road, 
and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As they brought the coat to Jesus, this donkey that they brought, it said that they began to lay their clothes upon the donkey. And then Jesus sat on the donkey. I believe there's another lesson that Jesus was teaching. When he had them to go bring him the donkey. Notice Jesus said to his disciples, he said, the donkey has never been set upon. The donkey has never been ridden. He brought that out as he gave the command to the disciples to loose him and bring them to him. The question then is why did Jesus want this donkey? Why donkey at all? And again, there's a lesson that is taught here. There's insight and revelation for us today to gain from this. And the first reason now, I want you to get that the reason why Jesus asked for the donkey instead of a horse, because the Bible reveals that a donkey was a symbol of humility, humbleness, and a peace. When kings would ride upon a donkey, that means they were coming to make peace. But when kings came in riding on a horse, that means that they were coming to make war. So Jesus came riding into, into Jerusalem on a donkey. Why? He was coming to make peace. What peace? He was coming to make peace between God and man and between man and man. For the peace between God and man had been broken by our forefather Adam. There had been a separation. And now Jesus was coming to make peace between God and man, to reconcile man back to God. So he comes in riding on a donkey. And this donkey represented humility. If you read it, this in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, it is found in Matthew 21. And it says in verse 5, this was prophecy given by Zechariah about Jesus coming into Jerusalem as he was preparing to lay down his life for us. It says, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a coat, the fall of a donkey. The prophecy revealed that this is how Jesus was going to come into Jerusalem. Riding on this donkey. Because it meant he was coming to make peace, not war. It meant that he was coming in as a king that was humble. A servant that was humble. He wasn't coming in as many thought he would come as a warlike king, as a king coming to just take over. No, he was coming in as a humble king, one that will lay down his life that we may have life, that we may have once again peace with God. For the Bible tells us that we had been alienated from God, but through Jesus Christ, peace was made between God and man. I want you to understand that he is going to come back again riding on a horse. 
because the book of Revelation tells us that when he comes back again to make war this time, he's going to be riding on a white horse and he's going to have the sign upon him that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords and he's coming back to make war and this time he'll be riding on a white horse. He understood that riding on the horse coming into Jerusalem was one about making war. But riding in on this donkey was one about making peace. One about being humble. He understood that it was humility that was going to exalt him. He understood that coming in lowly was going to be the thing that caused him to be lifted up and raised up. And that's a word to us today. That's a lesson for us today. That's a kingdom principle for us today. That if we come in humble and that if we would humble ourselves, that the Lord will exalt you. That if you would come in low, God will lift you up high. The Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will exalt you. I want you to know that after Jesus had went to the cross, the Bible tells us that once he was raised up from the dead, it says that now, he has been exalted above all principalities, all power, all might, and dominion, and above every name that is named. My God, my God. It says that all things have been put on his feet. Why? Because he came in humble, and he was exalted and raised up high. And that's the word for you. That this is a season, this is a time where we are to be mindful to humble ourselves before the Lord. That it's humility that lifts up. Hallelujah. Not pride and arrogance. Because it's pride and arrogance that brings down. But it's humility that exalts. And so he chooses the donkey. Another reason I want, I want you to understand why he chose this donkey, the one that was in the village tied up. Why did Jesus choose this donkey? What was that all about? What is the lesson there for us to learn? And the lesson for us to learn on that particular, on this particular one is this. Jesus said to his disciples, this donkey has never been set upon. He has never been written before. Why was that important? It was important because Jesus wanted his disciples to understand this principle. That he must have the preeminence or first place in all things. Oh, he wants you to get that too. He wants us to understand that too. That he is to have first place in all things. And so he had to be the first to ride up on this donkey. That's why he wanted this particular one. He had never been ridden before. He must have preeminence. He must have first place in all things. The Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1, in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 18, it tells us that he's to have preeminence of first place in all things. That's why he chose Mary to come through her womb. Why? Because Mary was a virgin. And he had to come through a womb that was pure. He had to come through a womb that had not been uh, 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 
uh, uh, uh, entered before, uh, 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 messed with before. He had to come through a virgin womb. He had to be the first. He chose this donkey because this donkey had not been ridden upon. What was in it for the donkey? <laughs> the same thing that will be in it for you. You will be loosed. You will be used by God in mighty ways. You will fulfill great purpose. You will be right smack in the will of God. And so he chooses you. And you need to understand that he needs to have first place in all things concerning your life. When you give him first place, he tells us in Matthew 6 and 33 that all things that you need will be added to you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? And all these things shall be added to you. See, when you put him first, he'll meet every need that you have. When you put him first, you'll know that you are in the will of God. When you put him first, you'll be fruitful in every good work. When you put him first, you'll have insight and revelation and spiritual understanding. He's to have first place. He wants the church to understand that. And we are the church. We are his body. First place. Yes, first place. We also find in verse 11, all of these lessons that I'm sharing with you now was all on the first day, which was Sunday, the first day of the week. That first day as he begins to ride into Jerusalem. And it tells us in verse 11, Mark 11, verse 11, it says, And Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So on this first day, Sunday, Palm Sunday, he rides into Jerusalem on this donkey, and he goes into the temple. He goes into the church, the house of God. And on this particular visit, it says that he looks around. He checks things out. And because the hour was getting late, it says now he returns back to Bethany, him and his 12 disciples. Note that his disciples was always with him during this week, this Passion Week, leading up to his death. He kept his disciples right there with why he was teaching them. He was giving them insight and revelation. And he returned back to Bethany. Now, Bethany, this is where Jesus' friend Lazarus lived with his sisters Mary and Martha. And it is believed that this is where Jesus and his disciples were living in Bethany during this Holy Week or this Passion Week that led up to his crucifixion. So he returned back to Bethany that evening from Jerusalem. Verse 12, it says, Now the next day, now it is the second day of Passion Week, which is Monday. The next day, the Bible says, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. He came to it 
He found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. And then they came on into Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple again and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. And then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now on the second day Monday, as he was going into Jerusalem, it says that he saw a fig tree and the fig tree had leaves on it. It appeared to have figs on it because when a fig tree had leaves, it meant that it also had figs. So he drew near to this fig tree and when he drew near to the fig tree, he realized that the fig tree had no figs. And it says that he said to this tree, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. We have come to know and we phrase this as, or we term this as, he cursed the fig tree. And the question is, why did he curse the fig tree? And the answer is simple. The fig tree does have uh, and does symbolize many things. It symbolizes Israel as one. But I want to talk uh, and focus on why he cursed the fig tree. And the reason why Jesus cursed the fig tree and said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again was because the fig tree appeared to have figs. It showed signs that it had figs. That its purpose was being fulfilled and going forth to bear figs. And Jesus was hungry, the Bible says. But when he drew near to it, he realized that even though it had signs that it would have figs, that it appeared to have figs, when he drew near to it, it had no figs. No food to take care of his need of hunger. So Jesus cursed it. And the thing for us to understand is that I believe the lesson here is that the fig tree was deceptive. It was a tree of deception. Appeared to have it, but didn't have it. And so Jesus cursed it. Purpose was not being fulfilled. The reason of why it was there was to produce figs. It wasn't. It only appeared to have figs. Jesus is not caught up on appearance. I say he's not caught up on appearance. Jesus is into production, productivity, purpose being fulfilled. Not just appearance. 
And so the tree was cursed. He wants us to understand something, and I want you to understand something. Because when he established the new covenant through his blood, we are no longer under the curse. We are under grace. Somebody ought to praise him right now. Somebody ought to think him right now that you're no longer under a curse, but you're under grace. But there's something you need to understand even under grace. And that is found in the book of Proverbs chapter 26. And it says this, Proverbs 26 and 2. It says, like a fleeting sparrow, like a bird flying by, it cannot light upon you unless it has a cause. He's speaking of a curse. And he says that a curse cannot come upon you. A curse cannot stop with you unless you give it a cause. A curse cannot operate in your life unless you give it a cause. And so Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that unless you open the door to it, unless you give a cause for it, a curse cannot alight upon you. It has to pass. I say it has to pass unless you give it a cause. It is said like this to give you a better understanding in the book of Numbers. When Balaam, when the man, Balak was trying to get Balaam to curse the children of Israel. And it was said that how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce whom God has not denounced? The only way a curse can operate in your life is that you have to open up the door and give it a cause. So we find here that this fig tree, the reason why it was cursed is because it gave Jesus a cause. It appeared to have figs, but did not have figs. So let's be wise and let's understand that curses can't operate in our lives. We don't have to be afraid of somebody talking about they're going to curse you. Be afraid of somebody, somebody they're trying to put something on you. No, a curse cannot come up on you unless you open the door for it and unless you give it a cause. We need to know that. We need to be confident of that. No one can curse what God has blessed. You have to open the door. We have to walk in these kingdom principles. We have to walk in these lessons that Jesus was teaching all along the way to the cross. Hallelujah. Well, our time is upon us today. We're going to pick back up on this as we look at these lessons that Jesus taught his disciples on the way to the cross prior to his resurrection. Praise God, praise God. From Sunday to Sunday, Jesus was teaching his disciples as well as the church about kingdom living and the kingdom of God. Amen, amen. I tell you, when we get this, it's going to cause us to be wiser. It's going to cause us to be stronger and to know about kingdom living and the kingdom of God. Amen. Oh, blessed be his name. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord God, for this resurrecting word. Thank you for insight. 
and all the things that you have revealed during your passion week. During the time that you were going to the cross to set us free. Thank you. Thank you. Hosanna to the highest. And that word Hosanna, it means save me. Yes. Save me. There may be someone who's listening right now. You need to be saved. You need to be rescued. You need to be delivered. And it's only through Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. This is the word of God. If you would like to be saved, if you would like to be delivered, if you would like to be set free, then Jesus is ready and has made a way already to set you free, to save you, to rescue you. How is it done? It is done by you confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart that Jesus died for your sins and he rose again on the third day. So if you're ready to be saved, ready to be rescued, ready to be delivered, ready to make Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord, then say this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins and you rose again on the third day. Come into my heart. Be my personal Savior and Lord. With that confession and with that believing in your heart, with that prayer, you are now saved. Jesus is now your personal Savior. Welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah. Yes, you are now my brother or sister in Christ. He has set you free. You have been born again spiritually. Now, walking out your new relationship with the Lord, there are some things that we have that we can share with you. And in the scriptures, they give us directions on how to walk out your relationship with the Lord. If we can be of help to you, contact us. Let us know that you made Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord and we'll be glad to share some things with you that will help you in your new walk with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory be to God. You are eternally saved. That's a promise of God. Hallelujah. How do you contact us? Simply go to our website, AriseChristianCenter.com. You'll find all of our contact information there. So, Give us a call. Shoot us an email. Let us know that you made a decision for the Lord today. And you would like some things that will be a help to you. And we'll be glad to get that to you. Amen. God bless you. I am glad and I rejoice with you for that decision you made today. Now, before we sign out today, I just want to pray with you over a couple of things. First, over your finances, increase for your household, increase for you personally in the arena of finances. God wants to prosper you. Yes, that's right. God desires to prosper you. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. That is his word. So I would like to get in agreement with you that this is the season that God is going to prosper you as you obey his instructions. Because he gives instructions on how we can prosper, on how we can grow in the financial arena. We have to obey those instructions. So 
I'm going to pray that you will be obedient to God's instructions and that you will see the increase that God will bring. His instructions include giving. His instructions include uh, 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 giving tithes and offering. His instructions include sowing, planting. And those instructions will bring increase to you, will bring a harvest back to you. It's all here in the word of God. So let me pray and get into agreement that your obedience would become full and that you would see the increase given by the Lord. Amen. Lord, I come into agreement now in the name of Jesus that people will be obedient to your instructions, obedient to your word concerning their finances, sowing and giving that they may reap and that you, you may give increase, that a bountiful harvest will come forth as they obey your word. I agree with them now that their obedience would be full in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes, if you begin to obey the Lord, he's true to his word. Amen. I know he's true to his word. So we thank the Lord for your obedience. And I thank the Lord that you are going to see increase in the name of Jesus. I take this time out to thank those who are sowing into this ministry, who are giving into this ministry, that the work of the Lord may continue to go forth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate you, and we'll believe in with you as well, that you will see increase as well. You are doing the things that God has instructed you to do, and a harvest is coming forth. Again, we want to thank you. And the other thing I want to pray for you quickly right before we sign out is for needs, other needs to be met. Spiritual needs, physical needs, relational needs. I want to pray for you. We're constantly praying for those uh, who are part of Arise. We pray for the body of Christ as a whole. But I want to pray with you who are tuned in right now. Lord, I thank you that each and every need that they have shall be met. Healing taking place. Relationships, Lord God, restored. I thank you right now, Lord God, that where there's lack, you are meeting the need. I thank you, Lord God, where their spiritual uh, uh, maturity is lacking. That, oh, Lord God, they will grow in you. We thank you now for every need being met. Restoration and deliverance. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, again, today is our first day of coming back together with, with, with in-person service and and we're looking forward to next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. Meet us. Join us. Our service will be held at 4095 Overland Avenue in Cover City, California. That is 4095 Overland Avenue in Cover City, California. That is on the northwest corner of Overland and Cover Boulevard in Cover City. Join us 9.30 a.m. for our resurrection service. God bless you. God keep you. This is Pastor Ron encouraging you to go higher in the things of God. God bless We'll see you on the next one.